not only to oil and gas reserves but to other many reserve engineering topics as well and i have number of technical publications in internal journals international journals including sp journal journal of petroleum technology jcpt and many other international journals like that so as far as today's agenda of this webinar is concerned we will start with sorry definition of oil and gas reserves what criteria need to be followed for a hydrocarbon resource to be classified as reserves classification of reserves based on uncertainty and development status difference between 1p reserves and sec sec stands for security exchange commission i'll come to that term in detail later and some common ratios like r by p 1p by 2p eur you are stand for expected ultimate recovery or estimated ultimate recovery and what's the significance of these numbers okay before really we even start and go into what is reserves we need to know what is a hydrocarbon resource okay when you talk about hydrocarbon resource many people think in different ways some people think that hydrocarbon resource is the in place volume of oil and gas in the ground some people think that it is the amount of oil that i can recover from really any accumulation in the ground okay but it is none of these none of these really qualified for a resource we talk about hydrocarbon resource it is any accumulation of hydrocarbon okay that is known or anticipated to exist See, the words which are underlined are very important you might know that hydrocarbon exists or you don't know really but you think that it exists in any subsurface rock formation within the company's exploration and production acreage now when you talk about what is the volume of hydrocarbon resource first thing is that it has to be project based okay and it is always reported as the quantity of crude oil natural gas and natural gas liquids that will be available for sale upon production so suppose you have an accumulation of oil and gas and everything is fine you are recovering but you are not in a position to sell this oil and gas for whatever reason for technical reason for political reason for whatever reason then your hydrocarbon resource volume is zero this point should be very very clear to you we are referring only to the available sales volume okay this is one second point which is a very important it is project based suppose you have got a very big field and you think to develop this field maybe 200 wells required okay but to start with you are doing a project which has only 25 wells then your hydrocarbon resource volume at that point will be associated with the volume of oil and gas that you will be producing from these 25 wells only and nothing much okay so all hydrocarbon resource volume are associated with some project these two points should be very very clear to you that is a sales volume which is associated with some project now there is a big classification of hydrocarbon resource volume okay it can be undiscovered then it is discovered then lot of work goes in and then it is really matured into reserves and then we sell the oil and gas and make money this whole process of classification that we will discuss today in this session okay becomes relevant because prior to 2007 the oil and gas industry did not have a unique standard of really measuring this resource volume okay the problem with it, this was that suppose a company like shell it calls something as reserves okay by their definition another company let us say bp or chevron they might not really call it at reserves they might call it put it in some other basket okay so what that uh, what what was the problem with that is that suppose some you are an independent investor or you you are investing in an oil and gas project okay you don't have a common base really to tell really or the same or not okay so to really get over this confusion a committee was formed all the oil and gas companies they joined together and they gave sp sp is the society of petroleum engineers it's a technical body okay and they were given the responsibility of making a system which will be agreeable to all and 
all the major companies in the world participated in that process. That is why we call it SP, Society of Petroleum Engineer, PRMS is Petroleum Resource Management System. They worked on it and the first in the year 2007, okay, it was approved by the Board of Society of Petroleum Engineers, okay. And then based on that, the other who's and who of oil industry, American Association of Petroleum Geologists, AAPG, Society of Petroleum Evaluation Engineers and World Petroleum Council, they also endorse this method, okay. So this SPPRMS comprises of classification, definition, guidelines, glossaries, technical standards, all these things are detailed in this and these are available in the public domain. If you want, you can have that. Now, subsequent to 2007, there have been major revisions in two years, 2011 and 2018, but things were revised. Okay, the standards cannot remain constant. As we learn more and more, we need to revise the standard to reflect the, our new learning. The so latest version, okay, latest updated version, when you call it as SPPRMS, is the SPPRMS 2018 version. Now, why this is really required? Okay, why do you need a really a uniform standard? In this oil and gas industry, lot of stakeholders are involved. Okay. There are large international oil companies like Shell, Chevron, Total, okay, ExxonMobil, the large international oil companies. The number of national oil companies which are very big, okay, like Saudi Aramco, Kuwait Petroleum, the large number of national oil companies. There are small independent operators, okay. Then there are regulators, there are investors who invest in the oil and gas business. They might not really be operators, but they invest in oil and gas business. There are agencies, there are different organizations, and obviously there's a public at large. They really want to know really what's happening in the particular business. The whole objective of SPPRMS is to create a global standard and reference for the industry so that all stakeholders can get a very complete, reliable, and consistent picture on what will the future production and associated cash flow estimate throughout the life cycle of the project. A typical oil and gas life cycle can be very large. There are onshore fields which are producing for more than 50 years, 60 years. There are offshore fields which are producing for more than 30 years. So I want to know really what's the volume that will come out, okay? From this, over this entire life cycle and it is intricately related with how much of cash flow will be associated with it. So this system, as I told you in the very first slide, is project based. So if you don't have a project, your hydrocarbon resource is zero. Okay, you have made a big discovery. Okay, let me give an example. There's a huge interest volume, maybe 500 million cubic meter. And you have not made any project or anything like that. It is in the ground. Nothing else is there. Then your hydrocarbon resource volume is zero because there is no project to really recover it. Now, two things really make this PRMS system very versatile. We will always talk about two parameters. One is classification, okay, is based on project chance of commerciality and categorization is based on recoverable uncertainty. Let me explain what it's mean by this. Classification means, suppose I have discovered a huge oil and gas accumulation, okay, but that doesn't really make it commercial okay lot of work need to really go in from the discovery stage to really bring it to the commercial stage where i can sell this oil and gas and make money so classification measures how close you are to commerciality are you very close to commerciality or you have reached commerciality or very far away from it okay categorization is entirely different categorization really captures the uncertainty which is intrinsically there in how much you recover from a particular project because you don't know really. There is no way we can tell 100% this is the amount of volume I'll recover. So there's an uncertainty associated with that. Categorization captures this uncertainty. I'll talk about a bit more detail with a diagram in the future slides. Then one of the things that is very much essential really when you talk about commercial is that it should be really economic. It should make money, okay? Now, 
in SPPRMS, the, the evaluators forecast, suppose you are a company X, okay, you think that the future price of oil will be $65 per barrel or $80 per barrel. It doesn't stop you from doing that. That depends on your discretion, okay? So your base case, you can use the future condition estimation. What, what discount rate you'll use for your money? SPPRMS doesn't tell on that. You can use your things. And SPPRMS is so versatile that it can be used for both conventional and non-conventional resources. Now, this diagram over here is very, very interesting, really. If you look at this, this diagram is very interesting. Uh, you see, how the ENP cycle, ENP stands for exploration production life cycle is there. You first start with really, suppose you have gone to a totally virgin area, you don't know much. You are doing shooting seismic data or magnetic data or satellite data. But a point will come when after, based on all that, you will make a map with a drilling location. This is known as a prospect. This is a generation of the prospect. At this point in time, I haven't drilled any well or anything, but I have generated a location, at least one location, based on all my data. Then you can go and drill the well. Okay, you can go and drill the well. Then, if you are lucky, you might get oil. There can be a discovery. Then, the discovery might, you might think that it is worthwhile pursuing further. You might do some appraisal well and then you start developing the field. Then you start developing the field, then you start producing oil. This barrel shows that you are producing the oil. You sell the oil and make money. This is the dollar that symbol that you make money. Then as the field progresses, the field develops, you might come with, okay, let us do more infield drilling or let us do water flood or whatever it is, field optimization. And then in many, many cases, you might think that, okay, at the end of the primary stage also, a lot of oil and gas has been left behind. I can go for some enhanced oil recovery. I might go for polymer flood. I might go for ASP. I might go for some thermal method depending on various factors. But whatever you do, at the end of the day, the production will decline and really a field has to be abundant. It is very much like a human life. Okay, that is why they're telling asset management from cradle to grave. Why? When a baby is born, mother puts the baby in a cradle next to her and takes care of the baby and ultimately whatever you do in your life you can go to gym you can run a marathon you can eat only healthy food all of us will die and go to the grave so this asset management cycle from prospect generation to abandonment is the entire ENP life cycle and SPPRMS takes care of this across this entire life cycle so, as I told you, that SPRM is project base. Okay, so now we'll come to a definition of a project in the next slide. Okay, you have a lease. This lease is a physical boundary. Within this lease, there can be multiple reservoirs. Okay, there can be multiple horizons where you think oil and gas exists. Now you are doing a project. A project you are doing a project. Project might involve drilling some n number of wells or putting some injectors, putting some surface facilities, putting some pipeline. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to transport the oil, sell the oil and make money. That's your ultimate goal. Okay, because if you don't sell oil, you don't make money, your hydrocarbon resource volume is zero. This point, I'll tell number of times. Okay, I want to emphasize on this point. It is only the sales volume of oil and gas which matters in hydrocarbon resource volume not anything else. So I take, go to a particular reservoir, a reservoir might have some interest volumes, and then depending on the project, I'll have, I'll do a project, which might involve drilling a few wells, surface facility, pipeline, or whatever, I'll get some resource. And then, if this lease, if this particular project, okay, that you are working with, is shared, it has number of partners maybe, most of the big projects in the world, nobody does it alone. There can be multiple partners. Suppose a particular partner has 30% share of that. Then he gets 30% share as per the contract terms. And that is his share of the hydrocarbon resource volume. So hydrocarbon resource volume is always the sales volume. And it is always associated with a project. If you don't have any project, 
you might have huge accumulation of oil and gas in subsurface formation but your hydrocarbon resource volume is zero okay i hope it is clear to you let me move ahead because we will strictly stay uh, try to have it in one and a half hours now we define a project what is a project okay as far as oil and gas industry is concerned any activity that requires petroleum when applied to reservoir is a project okay it is any activity it can be a subsurface activity like drilling some wells drilling some injectors or it can be a pure surface activity also maybe i am making i am i'm having a gas field okay i am installing another stage of compression that will result in increase of more volume and that is also a project because this additional compression stage will help you in recovering more gas a project generates petroleum production and cash flow any project will have two things there will be cash flow initially i'll spending money i'll be drilling wells i'll be making the surface facilities i'll do the pipelines lot of cost will go in okay and then i start generating production and start making money the sum of future production and cash flow schedule when taken to economic or contractual limit defines resource recovery what this last sentence means now i generate a production profile i am doing some project it will be associated with a production profile the best estimate this is a production profile and there will be cash flow because i'll be having capex i'll be spending i know when i am drilling so many wells when i am making the surface facilities or what is my opex okay because money is required not only for the initial capital expenses but to really produce our wells manage a system i need money that those are known as opex so we go on to how long really i'll continue the production schedule till the point in time it will make money okay as soon as you stop making net money it stops so it stops as an economic limit because you're not making money you're stopping it or contractual limit because in most countries the stoep the in place volume always belongs to the government okay they might have given you contract till let us say 2060 you might have a production profile beyond 2060 but you cannot continue that will not be your hydrocarbon resource your since your contract is till 2060 for example then i will only consider the volume that i'll get till 2060 by and i can i have the authority to sell the volume till 2060 and make money so my production profile will be cut down at 2060 latest or if it becomes uneconomic before that at some prior date okay so these are some of the very important points that any hydrocarbon resource estimation is always the sales volume and it is always associated with one production profile and associated with the project having capex and opex now coming straight to really the spp rms because if i want to tell you about reserves i can't tell you straight about reserves without having some idea about classification and categorization okay this is a diagram straight away lifted from spp rms okay broadly all the hydrocarbon resource volume can be subdivided into three categories one is prospective resource one is contingent resource and one is reserves you see this is the y axis the y axis shows increasing chance of commerciality but once it is becomes a reserve then i put it on production i start making money so as we move from prospective resource to contingent resource to reserves my chances of being commercial is increasing so the y axis shows increasing chance of commerciality the three broad classification categories prospective resource contingent resource and reserves now what is there on x axis x axis shows the range of uncertainty okay we are telling about how much volume i will recover by doing some project since uncertainty the uncertainty is very much intrinsic to any subsurface system okay in a, i have seen oil and gas reserves which has recovered maybe 90% of the ur still we really don't know exactly how much will be my reserves how much will be my ur there is always uncertainty associated with any subsurface data because of that this x axis measures this uncertainty we look at best estimate which for reserves i call it 2p for contingent resource i call it 2c and for prospective resource i call it 2u the low case estimate i call as 1p 
for reserves. One C, C stands for contingent, okay? And one U, U means undiscovered. Prospective resources are undiscovered resources. You think, the geologist thinks, the engineer thinks that oil and gas is there. And if I do this project, I'll make this money, okay? So it is undiscovered. So they call it one U, two U, and three U. If you are using some probabilistic method for the estimation, I call it P90. That there is a 90% chance that I'll produce this volume. 2U means P50. This 50% chance is there, I'll get this volume. Means that is practically the median. The 50% chance, I'll get more than this. And 50% chance, I'll get less than this. And P10 is the high case estimate. There's only 10% chance that I'll, I'll exceed that volume. So I'm calling it 1U, 2U, 3U, 1C, 2C, 3C, 1P, 2P, 3P. This in SPPRMS 2018 version, 1P, P1, I call it proved, P2, I call it probable, and P3, I call it possible. So P1 plus P2 is 2P, 2P means proof plus probable, and 3P means proved plus probable plus possible. So this is the thing which is coming from the uncertainty range. Okay, and this Y axis, is totally independent of the x-axis. It is telling how close you are really to commercialize. How far? Maybe you have just made a. You haven't made a discovery at all. So really, you are here. Then you made a discovery. I have moved to contingent resources. This contingent resources is also subdivided into various part, various stages depending on various companies. The reserves also is again subdivided into various parts. We'll we'll talk on that as we move into this course. So as we really go from this point from which is prospective resources to really reserves and finally to production, I am increasing my chance of commerciality. Y axis measures how close are we to commerciality and X axis measures my uncertainty range and they are very much independent of one another as an X and Y variable in a coordinate geometry. For any value of X, you can have any value of Y. So this is the separation of classification and categorization. I hope you are clear. Categorization reflects the uncertainty in the estimated volume, classification tells you how close are you to commerciality. So since I told you that uncertainty is there intrinsic in any hydrocarbon project, low estimate we call as P90, we sometimes call it high confidence case or proof case. P50 is the medium confidence, is a proof plus probable. And P10 is a very low confidence case or this is a high estimate. We also see what is a high case, really, if you get really P10. Okay, so these three are usually told. See, strictly speaking, I can use P90, P50, P10 if you are using some probabilistic method. If you are not using probabilistic method, but you are using deterministic method, then we can tell as low case estimate, best case estimate, and high case estimate. This I am explaining by means of this diagram. I hope most of you know about it. This is a distribution, okay? This is a P50. P50 means the area of the curve on the right-hand side and area of the curve on the left-hand side is same. The 50% chance. P10 means I have only 10% of the area on the right-hand side of the curve and 90% area on this side. And P90 means I'll easily produce this volume because the chances of producing a volume less than P90 is very, very small. Is very, very small. Okay. Today's webinar is on res is reserves. Now you might be thinking, this guy told that he'll talk about reserves, why he's not coming to reserves. Because he'll not appreciate what is reserves unless you come to the definition of the various category of hydrocarbon resources. As I've told, first is the prospective resource. Okay, it is an estimated volume. All cases are estimated. All volumes reported are as on a particular date. The standard is we report everything on 31st December of any particular year. If it is a prospective resource, that means it is not discovered to be potentially recoverable from undiscovered accumulation. Please remember, as soon as discovery is there, you don't have any prospective resources. Because there is nothing to really prospective. You have already discovered. So prospective reserves is always undiscovered by application of some future projects. Next is contingent resource. It's are those quantities of petroleum estimated as of a given date to be potentially recoverable from known accumulation. You see, here it was undiscovered accumulation. It has moved to 
known accumulation. That means discovery has happened. But applied projects are not yet mature enough for commercial development. It means you haven't sorted out all the components of commerciality. You haven't sorted out all the components of commerciality. So it is not yet commercial. So it is not a reserve. It is contingent because there are many contingencies on which the maturity from contingent resource to reserve depends. So we, we classify all these things as contingent resources. Then finally, we come to reserves, which has the highest level of maturity, are those quantities of petroleum anticipated with commercially recoverable, very important. If you don't have a commercially recoverable oil, your hydrocarbon resource volume associated with that project is zero. By application of development projects to known accumulation from a given date forward under defined condition, you clearly tell this is my project. In this project, I'll drill 26 vertical wells, 11 horizontal wells, 26 water injectors. This is my depth and everything is completely defined. Then only, and then the project is 100% defined. Then only I can tell that it has matured into reserves. We'll talk on that. Maturity from contingent resource to reserves is one of the most important topic that will be covered in today's webinar. Let's move ahead with that. Now, how do you really estimate a resource volume? Suppose you're a reservoir engineer or any subsurface person, you're trying to find out the resource volume estimation. The way we do is that first, you identify a recovery project associated with the reserve. Maybe you have got a reservoir, we have discovered, and you decide that, well, let us first drill 12 wells. Okay. You estimate the volume in place. Okay. And you then find out by drilling these wells that you are talking about in this project, how much oil you will get. So it has to be done by means of a production profile. I just cannot tell it is some oil in place into some recovery factor which you, have, you are dreaming of. Nothing like that. Each and every hydrocarbon resource volume estimation at whatever stage, even it is undiscovered, has to be made by means of a project and there should be a production profile associated with that project. And then I classify the project on its maturity. I tell that, okay, this is not discovered. I'm making this production profile based on some analogous data and all that. Then I tell, okay, this is undiscovered. Okay, so chance of commerciality is very, very low. Okay, and now you might have a big field in which you might be doing multiple projects. Some of them are development projects, some of them are contingent projects, some of them are exploratory projects. Then what do you do? You make a production forecast. You need a production forecast. In production forecasts, we are always bothered about sales volume. Please remember, your hydrocarbon resource volume is the sales volume. If you're not selling it, you're not making any money. So it should account for deferment. Why? Suppose you have the capacity for producing 5,000 cubic meter of oil per day from some project. Just I'm giving some number. But you see that on an average, the deferment okay, of your thing is 15%. That means only 85% of the time, the system is available to you. Otherwise, there's some downtime in the system. Then. I will have to take this downtime into consideration because it is a sales volume. It is like you're running your car, okay, and you are trying to calculate how much distance it will travel. But suppose your car is old and you think that uh, your deferment period is 10% of the time it can break down on the road. Definitely, I can't really take that into account how much distance it will travel, okay? So it is always your deferment has to be considered because I'm always finding the volume which is available for sales. It includes consumed in operations. I'll talk about consumes in operations a bit later, not now. But I have to take out flares and losses because I'm not selling it and making money. Suppose low pressure gas, okay, for technical reasons, I'm flaring it. Or some, there is some loss in the system. Then this flaring and this loss that is happening in the system is not allowing me to sell that volume of oil and gas and make money. So these volumes, these small volumes, maybe whatever be the percentage, has to be taken out for calculation of hydrocarbon resource volume. Then production forecast should be terminated by any of the following. Technical limit, economic limit, or license cutoff. Let me try to explain to this what these limits are. 
So as I told you earlier, that any hydrocarbon resource volume estimate in whatever category it is associated with some project and some production forecast. Okay. Now suppose there is an onshore field and I think my field will last for 40 years, 50 years. There are many fields okay, which are producing for 50 years. In India, there is a field, Naharkatiya and all that, that is producing from more than 75 years really. And these wells are still producing really. So technical limits tell you okay, how long technically I can produce from this field. It may be dictated by many factors. It may be dictated by <coughs> that, okay, my well life, okay, is 25 years. Then you cannot take any production profile beyond 25 years because your wells will not be there. It is crossing the technical limit. Then economic limit. Why? Because any reserves is commercial. Okay, so I can't produce oil where I'm spending more money in generating the oil than I'm getting from selling it. So I've reached my economic limit. So I have to terminate it at economic limit. But whatever it comes, it's economic limit. The hard thing that might come up is license cutoff. You're always given any operator comes, it operates in any field. The government of that country gives you a license. That licenses are renewable. Like for example, let me tell you, I was working for PDO. The current license of PDO is till 2044, 31st December. So we don't consider anything beyond that date. So Shell is operating in this field. They won't consider any production beyond 31st December 2044. Though I am pretty sure many of those wells will really produce even in 2084. But those volumes will not be a part of hydrocarbon resource volume because it is being cut off by this license. So these are the three limits, more important limits, which terminates your production forecast. The technical limit, the economic limit, or the license cut off. Whichever comes first, your production profile is terminated there. So this shows really, this is a very important diagram really that all of us should understand because hydrocarbon resource association, uh, hydrocarbon resource estimation is very much associated with economics. So what this diagram shows really, let me tell you. This diagram shows what is really your cash out. Initially, I'm spending a lot of money. I'm making my facilities, drilling all my wells. A lot of money is going in. And then there is, a, after some time, there will be mainly maybe OPEX. And then at the end, as I told you, all fields have to be abandoned. So abandonment cost also is a very, very important cost. Abandonment cost, decommissioning cost, especially if it's an offshore field. So this is my cash out. And as soon as this is, as soon as really you start production, then really this is a production profile associated with it. Then you start, as soon as you start producing, you start making money. This is the nest cash surplus. So at this point in time, after that, you see, I'm not making any money. My net cumulative cash flow becomes, comes down. So I will terminate my production profile over here. So this determines the technical limit. This definitely depends on what oil price you are estimating, what is the discount rate you are using your calculation in your calculations that all will really determine really when your project really will become uneconomical. It depends on your economic parameters. Later, I'll be running a course on petroleum economics, really a full one week course. Then we'll talk on, on those parameters in detail, really. So you're working on some reservoir. Okay. The reservoir is already on production. And this one is the production profile that reserve engineer has made based on everything that how your production profile will go there. And suppose this is cut off by license till 2040 or whatever. And this volume under this curve, okay, this is cubic meter per day or whatever you need to use into the total time, the volume that will give, it is 2P developed reserves. 2P means it is a base case estimate. All companies work on base case estimates. So they are telling 2P, proved plus probable. 2P, NFA is a term used in the shell world. They call no further activity. Other companies, they might be using do nothing case or something like base case, different word, different terminologies are used, but it is no further activities. That means this is the profile I'll get if I decide not to spend any further capex, but I'll be spending money for OPEX. Any volume of oil, that can be produced by 
not using any further capital expenditure but really going ahead with my opex it is known as nfa no further activity and we call such volumes as 2p developed volumes this one volume we are doing some project for which approval has been obtained we call as 2p undeveloped miss reserves is definitely there we have got fid fid if some of you might know is final investment decision final investment decision of any project is the point where all the partners commit to spending money on that project and after that your construction activity can start it's a very important milestone in any project it is known as final investment decision if you have a very large project that you are executing you can book reserves only and only if you have an fid if you don't have an fid for major projects you cannot book any reserves it can be contingent resources but you cannot book any reserves then there is some cr project that means this is a volume this project hasn't really matured into reserves but you think that it is closer to commerciality some more extra work need to be done whatever the approvals or any work or you haven't done something so it is known as contingent resources okay and then you you might do some near field exploration so they are calling it has some really to you volumes as, as well to you is the base case exploration volume you think that this volume if i by executing this exploration you will get this gives the total hydrocarbon resource volume for this particular reservoir it comprises of 2p developed 2p undeveloped it has a cr project it has an exploration project it is not necessary that you have only two, one 2p undeveloped project you might have multiple 2p undeveloped projects also in a reservoir there can be a project where you are drilling some infill drilling maybe you are drilling 26 extra wells there can be a separate project where really you are really doing some flank water injection and it is only really drilling of maybe 6 or 7 injection wells so there can be multiple projects in each of this category so each category i take each project i take okay i make the production profile and really stack one above another and i that this way i estimate the hydrocarbon resource volume associated with the various projects and also i tell depending on the maturity which category it belongs to it belongs to reserves if reserves is a developed reserves it is undeveloped reserves or it is contingent resources or it is not even contingent it is to you volumes it is only prospective resources this is how i go ahead with any reservoir so now we come to the really more important topics of the day which is a part of this webinar when can any contingent resource project become a reserves when i can call it is now fine now i call it is a reserves we go with the sp prms definition first reserves are those quantities of petroleum anticipated to be commercially recovered you see the important term over here is anticipated because at any point in time it is a best case estimate no reserve engineer or anybody can give you an exact number it, nobody can tell you that i'll recover 26.1 million out of it so it is always an estimate to be a commercial recovery it has to be commercial okay by application of development projects to known accumulation from a given date forward so suppose i give a number on 31st december 2022 all the major companies in the world have been busy with the reserves work and have reported the numbers at a 31st december 2022 so what is the volume that will come forward like in the diagram that i have shown previously you see my profile starts from 2023 okay what is it really going forward so what are the conditions necessary to tell it is a reserves first it should be discovered if your field if your hydrocarbon volume is not discovered then it is a prospective resource no question of it being a reserves second it should be recoverable we had i have worked in fields where we have huge accumulation of oil and gas we know it exists but we cannot recover much from it so your recoverable hydrocarbon volume because maybe the oil is very viscous it cannot move for whatever reason so we are talking about only recoverable if nothing is recoverable then you don't have any reserves it has to be commercial okay commerciality has to be established we'll discover we'll discuss the term commercial in bit more detail in the future slides it is always a remaining volume i am calculating what is coming forward 
what has been produced earlier is already sunk okay it is not available to me so whenever we talk about reserves we talk about remaining volume the volume which is not yet produced or which will be produced in future and the last point which i have emphasized number of time it is always the sales volume okay it is always the sales volume how much volume i'll be actually sell okay so i have to take into consideration deferment or any other factor but sometimes what happens especially in gas reservoirs we consume a part of the volume for our internal consumption internal work for running the field those volumes are known as cio volumes cio stands for consumed in operation it really really happens mostly in gas reservoirs but there are examples in oil reservoirs as well where we had cio volumes i know when i was working in pdo there was a reservoir the oil from that some of the oil was being used for making oil based drilling fluids so that part of the oil that i use for making okay that drilling fluid is consumed in operations so that is a part of reserves we write reserves a if not available for sale we put in a separate category is a reserves but not available for sales okay that is consumed in operation or maybe in gas which is most common really cio volumes can be quite substantial you might be using it to run your compressor for doing some power plant internally which is really helping in your oil and gas production those volumes are known as cio volumes which are known as consumed in operations then two things we are talking about okay whenever we are talking about reserves there are two broad things technical maturity and commercial maturity now what is technical maturity from the time a discovery of hydrocarbon resource has been made we have made a discovery lot of work goes into it really initially most of the work is subsurface work geologists petrophysicists geophysicists reservoir engineer geologists all will be working okay how best to really exploit this field so that i can get maximum value out of it we work on it and come to something which is known as fdp which is the field development plan it is not that any field will can have only one field development plan many large fields producing for 50 60 years might have multiple fdps at various stages okay but if i want to book any hydrocarbon resource associated with the project for that project i should have an approved field development plan what is means approved means is a field development plan which has been approved by all the shareholders all the stakeholders everybody is telling okay we will follow this field development plan suppose i have made a field development plan and i am the head of reserve engineering i have made it and kept it in my almeda then it is not an approved fdp an approved fdp is one which has been signed off by all the stakeholders and second thing with reasonable expectation of being implemented suppose i have a beautiful fdp okay in pdf format or hard copy format signed by everybody but i am not showing any intent of implementing it then i can't tell that sufficient technical maturity is there if sufficient technical maturity is there the components of field development plan will be affected will be shown will be there in your business plan if it is not in your business plan that means you have an fdp it's a nice document looks good really but you don't have any intention of really you know implementing it so you should have an approved development plan and there should be reasonable expectation that it will be implemented second point is that no technical show stopper identified that have a reasonable expectation of materializing let me give you what can be a technical show stopper let us suppose as a part of a project i am doing a polymer flood project okay and now my reservoir has some temperature high temperature and exactly i don't know how i'll source the polymer okay which remains stable at that temperature of the reservoir that means it is a very definite show stopper i don't know really where the polymer will come from then it has not reached technical maturity though you have fdp 
you have all the simulation work, everything you have done, everybody assigned, you don't know really from where are you going to really get the polymer. Okay, so I can't tell that it has reached technical maturity. So for technical maturity, two things should be there. There should be an approved field development plan. Number two, you are showing that you want to really implement it. Suppose I want to lose weight. I make a plan that I lose weight by doing this and I take a membership of a gym also to lose that. But I don't show any really desire to go to the gym. Then I can't tell that there is no way that I lose weight. So there should be reasonable expectation of being implemented. And there should be no showstopper of any kind. I'm telling you in PDO, at one point in time, we are competing in many wells by rod pump and we had, didn't have pony rods. Sourcing pony rod had become very difficult in 2011-12 at that point in time. So we had to debook all the volumes. We tell that no, we don't know really when we'll get the pony rods will come. How will I complete all the real wells by rod pump? So any sort of, any technical showstopper will stop you from reaching technical maturity. After coming to technical maturity, I'll talk about commercial maturity. Before coming to commercial maturity, one point I want to really stress and you should be very clear about it. If a project shows net positive cash flow, then I can tell it is economic. But all projects which is economic may not be commercial. Okay. Suppose I am doing a business, you start doing a business. Okay. And you put in a lot of effort and at the end of the effort, you find that yearly you are making $100 out of the effort. Are you going to do it? You tell no, no, it doesn't meet my criteria. For a project to be commercial, the project should generate sufficient cash flow to meet the company's investment criteria. Each and every company has its investment criteria. Your NPV should be this much. Your internal rate of return should be this much or whatever. Your VIR should be this much. Okay. So to really call a project commercial, just positive cash flow is not sufficient. Positive cash flow is economic. But all economic projects are not commercial because it is not meeting your commercial criteria. In addition to this financial criteria, there are many other things which need to be addressed to tell that a project is commercial. It should include social, environmental, legal, regulatory, contractual and marketing conditions. Let me give you a very simple example. You have a very gas field, you have an FDP, everything is there, there is no showstopper. But because of some reason, political reason, you are not able to sign the gas sales agreement. There is some dis disagreement. Maybe the pipeline that where it is going through is going to some area where some terrorists might be operating. Nobody is trying, is taking the responsibility for that. That means you are not sorted out. You don't have the gas sales agreement. Then I can't tell that all commercial conditions have been reached. Environmental, very important. Suppose you are doing an offshore development in Gulf of Mexico. Okay, it has happened. You are doing. All approvals are there. Then the local fishermen, that start agitating. They tell that if you do this, my livelihood will be impacted. Government doesn't want to really get into all this trouble. They tell the company, please discuss and reach an agreement with all the fishermen and meet the conditions. Okay. Then till the point in time that agreement is reached, I can't call that the project is commercial. If a project is not commercial, then it can have contingent resources, but it cannot have reserves. Reserves is as good as money in the bank. When you tell that I have these reserves, it is as good as telling this much of money is in the bank. You, you can't tell, no, 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 my friend is there, he'll give me so much money, then that money will enter into bank, then it is a contingent resource. It is not a reserve. Reserves is as good as money in the bank. If you think of money, then money in the bank is reserves. I can go use my ATM card or do whatever and take out the money. Then it is a reserves. It cannot be dependent on something else. So, so the commercial maturity, as I have discussed in the previous slide, it should meet the company's current investment screening criteria in terms of NPV, in terms of internal rate of return, in terms of VIR or whatever, what, whatever company is telling. The, each company will have its own investment criteria. Market availability is assured. It is especially true for gas. If you don't have a gas sales agreement, how do you know that you will be able to sell the gas? Okay. Project execution is evidence to form intention to produce. You have an FDP. It looks beautiful. Everything is good. Is it in your business plan? Are you really executing it? 
and lastly as i told you no commercial source stopper like government government is telling no 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 you will be producing lot of you will be you will be producing lot of methane or ethane or whatever it is and no we don't want to do such projects at this point in time then the project is not commercial it is a show stopper okay or it can relate to legal contractual political you are going to a country where there is a political unrest and you are not sure whether you will be able to execute the project or not then it is not commercial okay so all this so commercial includes not only financial thing that the project profitability meets company's current criteria this is a must in addition to that financial criteria these criteria which i mentioned market availability especially for gas in terms of gas sales agreement project execution you are doing it is in the business plan and no commercial show stopper in terms of government legal partner contractual one one partner tells no 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 i am not going to invest in this project i don't find it that good okay something they want to withdraw from that then definitely it has not reached commercial maturity and i cannot book reserves against that particular project now coming to bit as i told you this topic is really reserves okay okay so reserves let me come to the categorization 1p 2p and 3p when we talk about 1p it is a low case estimate when i talk at 2p it's a base case estimate and it's 3p is a high case estimate okay if 1p volumes associated with a project is economic then i can book 1p reserves suppose i have a project everything is fine and even the 1p case okay which is a low case is also okay okay then i can book some 1p reserve but these are technical 1p reserves okay suppose the volume 2p is an economic project but 1p is not coming economic then that particular project can have a 2p reserves but it cannot have any 1p reserves okay now many projects to start with does not have any 1p reserves but still we go and do it it is not necessary that we do only projects which has 1p reserves okay suppose there is a project which requires huge upfront investment okay and 2p is coming economic if if 2p doesn't come economic no company is going to really do it it doesn't meet the company's investment criteria company might be fine that okay initially i don't have 1p now in in the initial part of the project the lot of capex once i incur that that capex that capex is a sunk cost the money is already gone okay then in future okay well i i'll not really get bothered because when i talk about reserves i'm talking about the future volume the future volume that i'll be producing might become commercial it might become economic because the sunk cost is already gone then i can have some technical one p reserves initially i might not have but after 1 2 3 years i might have i might have some one p volumes but these are all technical one p volumes when i talk about acc one p reserves it is a very very different ball game altogether acc stands for security exchange commission security exchange commission i'll talk about security exchange commission i think it is in the next slide i'm not sure we'll come to that acc reserves are based on acc specified technical and economic rules your acc reserves one p reserves can be very small much smaller than technical one p reserves let me come and talk about acc the acc will come after some slides i'll talk then really till that point in time let us go ahead okay some of the points i have already really told what is the resource base for any reserves estimation we are talking only about the sales quantity final sales volume we can consider consumer in operations really but i cannot consider any volume which is lost in flare or venting that i have already emphasized earlier now under reserves category there are two broad two broad classification one is developed reserves and one is undeveloped reserves what is developed reserves developed reserves are expected quantities to be recovered through existing well and existing equipment and operating method okay means the oil or gas that i can i can get from my existing wells without spending further capex 
okay, without spending further capex. And undeveloped reserves are those reserves, okay, which will require some amount of capex investment, like suppose any additional volumes that I am getting from drilling of new wells. They will be all undeveloped reserves because I need money, capex, to drill those wells. Suppose a well is there, but it needs to be deepened to go to a different horizon. It will be a part of capex. I need to drill infill wells. It will be part of capex. Or maybe some existing well is there, but to really bring that particular well into production again, because maybe there is some very complicated fishing job is involved or something is involved. The broad number that is given is 30% of the well cost. Suppose a well co cost is $1 million. Let us say for the purpose of discussion. To do a workover, I need $200,000. Then I can take it as developed reserves. But if it crosses $300,000 because it crosses 30% of the well cost, then it has to be put under undeveloped reserves. That's the rule, 30% rule. Let us not go into that sort of detail really in this particular webinar because we don't have too much of time left also and it is giving a broad idea really. Otherwise, if you want to go to the entire SPPRMS, how it happens, everything, it takes substantial period of time. We'll be doing that in near future over a five-day course really. The whole SPPRMS with examples and everything we'll be doing. So let us not focus too much on 30% of the well cost. Coming to a recap of what we have done till now, a reserves has to be technically and commercially mature. It can be 1P, 2P, 3P. It can be technical 1P. It can be SEC 1P. Proved SEC are used for external disclosure. We'll come to the SEC external disclosure a bit later in the slide. Contingent is 1C, 2C, 3C. Contingent reserves are not technically and commercially mature. Once it becomes technical and commercially mature, then your contingent resource will get upgraded to reserves. And prospective resources is always undiscovered. That is why we use the terminology U, 1U, 2U, 3U, low case estimate of prospective reserves, base case estimate of the prospective reserves, and the high case estimate of the prospective reserve. Please remember, prospective reserve is always undiscovered. As soon as discovery is made, prospective reserves move to contingent reserves, resources. And suppose you don't get any discovery, then your prospective resource becomes zero. Okay. Now, let me talk about what is SEC because some of you might be involved in estimating oil and gas resources. You should really know what is SEC. Now, SEC stands for Security Exchange Commission. SEC comes from Security Exchange Commission. What is SEC? It is a regulatory body which is there in USA. Okay. The job is of SEC is to maintain integrity of securities market. See, SEC is not for only oil and gas companies. Any company, any company, whether it is Microsoft, whether it is Google, whether it is Tesla or it is Chevron or whether it is any other company, GE, anything it can be. If it is listed, in US market, okay, it has to follow SEC's guidance. So SEC is a regulatory body which enforces laws, rules, and regulation. Main job of SEC is to protect the interest of the investor. Suppose I want to invest in some project. On what basis I'll invest really? The information that come to me should come to me on which I'll do an investment should be very reliable. So SEC tells all companies, whether it is an oil business or any other business, which is listed in US stock exchanges to give the basic data. It demands disclosure of information. The aim of all of this is to create a level common playing field. So that suppose you, I want to invest in any share of any company, whether I should buy the share of Shell or buy the share of Chevron or buy the share of Total or Exxon or none of these really. How will I decide really? So it creates a common playing field. It gives you the data which enables you to decide such thing and it is accepted by all other market regulators. SEC has the authority to enforce. If you violate rules, it can give you punishment. Okay, it can give you punishment. Now question comes, why should any other company be bothered about SEC? A company is in India, a company is in Oman. 
thing is that for two reasons it is important one all the major companies which are operating okay in joint ventures they are listed in us stock exchanges like in pdo shell shell is listed in us stock exchanges okay so the requirement is there even if a company is not listed in us stock exchanges many of the investors are from us they want the documentation that you are going is really really endorsed by sec so the companies which are not really listed in even us they try to give really produce sec 1p reserves like pdo it has no obligation to give really sec 1p reserves but we declared sec 1p reserves because suppose i want to take a loan from world bank they will give you based on what is your sec 1p reserves not on the estimate that you have made clear so that's why sec sec become very very important now sec proof reserve conditions are very stringent and the number can be much much smaller then your technical one preserve why sec tells some of the important points i am not going to cover all the points of sec that itself might take 5 hours the basic important thing is that they tell that reasonable certainty reasonable time to commence the project application of proved area application of reliable technology use of sec analog most importantly all economics for sec proved reserves should be done based on sec economy they tell what price of oil you should use 60 dollars 65 dollars 80 dollars that will totally change your reserves because your production profile will get extended sec doesn't give you any freedom they tell what is your year average price at what price you sell the oil first of january first of february first of march first of april first till first of december divided by 12 you have to use that price of oil for sec economics all cost year in cost what is the year in cost of drilling this well take it forward everything cash flow is undiscounted otherwise some companies take 8% discount some company take 10% discount some company take 12% discount they will all give you different values really different economics they tell clearly that all we should be in undiscounted second they have a very stringent test which i'll not discuss over here because it goes beyond the scope of this webinar you have to do undeveloped reserves economic test suppose you are drilling 20 wells in a field i'm just touching on that by doing undeveloped reserves economic test you have to demonstrate each and every of these 20 wells stand alone is economic otherwise you cannot include it in your production profile it is known as undeveloped reserves economic test maybe when you do a detailed prms course everything we will talk on the on undeveloped reserves economic test they also define really what is meant by reasonable certainty okay reasonable certainty means your expected ultimate recovery expected ultimate recovery is whatever oil you have produced in the past plus the amount you're telling that you will produce in future so it is constantly changing every year your estimate is changing then that estimate should consistently either remain constant or increase with time it can never decrease that means it is a very very high confidence case that is meant by reasonable certainty they give you a reasonable time for development what is meant by that suppose i am doing a project like right now in in oman we are drilling a big project in the field where we are drilling some 480 wells plus wells now these 480 wells will not be drilled in one two years it will drill over a period of time now since sec tells a reasonable time of development they clearly specify any well that you are drilling beyond five years cannot be included for proved reserves calculation why why five years from where five year comes because most companies in the world have a five-year business plan which is rolling so who knows really you have made a plan for five years and many of the wells you are drilling after 10 years, 11 years. After 5 years you review and tell that I own drill all this well. They are not coming that good. To really, really take care of the situation, they tell that your, there should be a reasonable time for development. And any well that you are drilling beyond the window of 5 years cannot come to contribute to your proof reserve. They can be in your 2P reserves. 2P is totally the discretion of the company. You can include. You are spending your money. Who is SEC to tell anything? The role of SEC is to protect the interest of the investors. Be very, very clear of that. 
it is not to protect the interest of the company then they tell i'm just giving one or two things to really give you the idea they're telling that for really calculation of 1p proof reserves you can take you have to first define a proved area now suppose this is a field okay here's an example this this one is shaded in black this is a well which is already drilled and i have produced oil and i have established then if my development plan suggests some well spacing maybe 300 400 500 meters then one development spacing i can consider for undeveloped reserves but anything beyond one development spacing i don't allow any well i put over there will not contribute to my scc proof reserves so rules are very very stringent then it defines lower loan hydrocarbon so this is a well okay this is a well that has been drilled this is a well that has been drilled this well has encountered water this well has encountered over here oil and it is oil so it has not encountered in any gas oil contact it has not encountered any oil water contact so here only this limit the volume over there bounded by these i can consider it for proof reserves not the other volume though i can tell that okay this here also it is oil then there's something known as reliable technology which again it is not possible to discuss in this one and a half hour webinar if there are some reasonable technology like pvt is a reasonable technology your mdt xpt is a reasonable technology if i can do that there are some reasonable technologies they, they are called reliable technologies which have been proved and demonstrated over the years that they give a very good result that i can use and i can book as proof results but i will really not talk about that in this webinar because of the paucity of time now two types of reserves are there at types of, in terms of, like in terms of categorization i told as 1p 2p cp i told as 1p acc and in terms of maturity it is developed reserves and undeveloped reserves this also i have touched in detail developed reserves are those which i can produce from ex my existing wells and facilities without further investment of capex only with the application of opex and undeveloped reserves are those which requires investment like drilling new wells or might be i have to do some surface facility maybe for gas i need another stage of compression all those need further expenses so those come under undeveloped reserves okay now i come to some of the important ratios that i have told that which is very important and sometimes used in hydrocarbon reserves okay one thing that is really used is r by p ratio what is r by p ratio it is mandatory for all companies to tell you what the what your reserves is at the end of every year 31st of december every year now i know how much volume is there also i have a production profile so let us say now i know what is, what a particular reservoir will produce during this year how much volume so the volume that i am producing i am producing from the reserves basket okay it is like you are withdrawing money from the bank exactly like that so reserves r by p is reserves to production ratio how much of reserves you have at the beginning of the year divide by how much of oil you want to produce from that particular reserve it is known as r by p ratio i can cal calculate r by p for 1p reserves i can calculate r by p for 2p reserves why r by p ratio is important i'll come and tell bit later but one of the thing is that in many countries the government they need to ensure that oil and gas is available okay for future years for how many years like for example in india r by p the government at one point in time they wanted to maintain as r by p is equal to 15 that it gives the comfort factor that for at least for 15 years i'll be able to produce my existing volumes okay and that is uh, that refers to 2p volumes when you talk about r by p ratio be very clear are you talking about r by p for 1p volumes or your r by p for 2p volumes you can calculate for both the reserves to production ratio is the most widely quoted figure in oil and gas industries 
it has certain strategic significance for companies which try to keep the value at approximately 10 for proof reserves. Like in India, we keep 10 for proof reserves around 15 for 2p volumes. Same sort of numbers people want to be very, very really comfortable with. If your R by P becomes too low, that means really, really your production, your, you have hardly much reserves base and you will not be able to maintain the production. It becomes a very, very, very big warning. There is another application of R by P ratio from pure reserve engineering standpoint that I will, I think there is a slide which I will tell, oh, it is there really. See, you calculate the reserves, okay. Cal cal working out of reserves is a very, very important function of a reserve engineer. Okay. These are assured internally, externally, sometimes by, by external parties as well. So typically R by P okay, for 2P developed reserves, developed reserves stands between 6 and 10. Okay, I've seen. It stands Suppose you get your R by P is 20 or R by P is 5. It has some connotation. If R by P is very large, I'll have a very serious doubt, okay, that your reserves may be very much overestimated or there's some severe production related issues. If your R by P is too small, maybe your, possibly your reserves is underestimated. This is, you know, just a trigger. It doesn't mean for 100% sure it is overestimated or underestimated, but it gives you a trigger for the person who is auditing your reserves. Another very important thing is RRR reserves replacement ratio. Any company, okay, any company tries to really replenish the reserves, okay, every year. Every year, a company is producing from his reserves basket, whatever the volume is. Then, your RRR is reserves addition during the year divided by producing production during that year. Most companies try to maintain an RRR of above one. That means if your RRR is above one, that means I am replenishing okay, my reserves by either maturing my, some of my contingent resources to reserves volume or some discoveries coming to contingent resources and then get in matured it means the company is healthy. If your RRR of any company is very low, suppose 0 0.2, 0 0.3, that means very soon the company's production will drop very drastically. Okay, and you know, suppose you're working for some company. One of the things that you should definitely see if you're changing your jobs, uh, what are your reserves parameter R? And one of the things you should see, what is the RRR of the company? If your RRR is very low and your current production is high, that means the company's chances of maintaining future production at higher level is very, very low. This is a very, very important trigger. Third thing is that expected ultimate recovery. Okay, your ex sometimes we call expected ultimate recovery or estimated ultimate recovery, same EUR. Is the estimate of a total quantity of oil and gas that can be ultimately recovered from a reservoir. It is cumulative production oil that you have already produced plus the reserve. So you can have 1 PUR, I can have 2 PUR, I can have 3 PUR. 1 PUR is cum production plus proof reserves. 2 PUR is cum production plus 2 P reserves. 3 PUR is cum production plus high P, 3 P reserves. Now, UR, okay, UR is not a constant but changes with time. Okay, this can happen. One or more projects can mature into reserves from contingent resource category. Suppose you are working on some, uh, you are doing water flood in a project field and you are thinking of doing some polymer project. Okay. You want to convert some of your water injectors into polymer injector. Last year, it was a contingent resource. But this year, you have matured it into reserves because all conditions have been missed. Then definitely, you are of a field can increase. Usually what happens for a developed reserve, you know, how much of oil that I will recover from any project is not known. Is not known really. Okay, it is associated with uncertainty. Okay, so developed ultimate recovery tells you cum production plus how much of developed reserves is there. So e, your EUR, okay, from EUR, okay, I can tell really what is my recovery factor including that project. I find the project recovery factor. Okay, now I have 1P case, I have 2P case, I have 3P case. We are more focused on 1P case by 2P case. Sometimes 
the difference between 1p by 2p ur can be very large. Let, let, let us look at this particular example. 1p ur and 2p ur tend to converge with time and becomes unity when the field is finally abundant. This is a hypothetical example of a field. A field had an 1p ur of 84 in 2019, 86 in 2020. This is at 2021 is progressively increasing because your 1p ur should always increase. Your 2p ur is gradually coming down. And you see your 1p by 2p ur is gradually converging and at abandonment it becomes one because only really when a field is abandonment the abandoned i can finally tell that how much recovery you are making from this so this is one of the check your 1p ur by 2p ur should converge with time if you are not converging with time there's some mistake in your estimation of your reserves let us not go into this topic in very big detail really because we will be covering it in in future but based on what we have done because i want to really really complete this within one and a half hour let me have a food for thought you think about it the two questions let me have your impression on that an operator has struck oil in a wildcat well that is established by production testing an operator is very lucky he drilled a wildcat well now he has established oil by production testing. So he is very happy and he gives a news item in everywhere. Operator X has discovered million, 500 million cubic meter of oil reserves. In reality, which of the following statements may be true? Undeveloped reserves is 500 million. Prospective resource is 500 million. Contingent resource is 500 million. Or estimated in place volume is 500 million. All of you think on this question. And there is a second question, which of the following parameters is more likely to increase than decrease? Your proved reserves, proved ex, ex, expected ultimate recovery, 2P reserves and 2P UR. Which parameter should always increase and should really decrease? Only one of these option is correct of A, B, C and D. Please think about it. Maybe when we discuss and you open the floor to question, we can talk about this similarly one or more options of these questions may be correct. Okay. You please think about it from whatever I have told in this class and tell which one may be correct. We'll discuss these two questions. Okay. After I get your feedback from the chat session. So this is a very, very brief description. Okay. On really, I have, I have not really covered the entire PRMS in detail. That's not the objective. The objective of this webinar was spelled out in detail and those objectives I have tried to achieve within a specified time of 90 minutes because nothing in this world can be open-ended really okay within 90 minutes if you have any question 